Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. So let's stand together, if we will, if you will. Verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, tonight I ask your help this evening. I need a fresh filling of your spirit. I need you to help me, Lord, to say the things that you've led me, Lord, to preach tonight in a way that's understandable to your people. And Lord, I pray then, so by your spirit, Lord, you'd make these things clear. Please guide and direct my thoughts and my words, and I pray from this passage tonight that we would not just gain information, but you would do a work in our hearts this evening that might make us desire to serve thee more. Lord, may this be fruitful knowledge of Jesus Christ that we gain tonight. And so, Father, please remove any distractions from this room and from our minds tonight. And we pray your will be done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, last week we began this series on the book of the Revelation. And uh, we began by looking at the first three verses of this book, which dealt with kind of like an introduction to the book. We saw last week the proper name of the book. And uh, this was part of the message last week. We see the very first words of chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is. It is not the revelation of St. John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a book that describes the time and events leading up to and beyond the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth visibly, puts down all of his enemies, and sets up his earthly kingdom to rule and to reign. And so understand this book was given to us to reveal these coming events. Matthew 6.10, the Lord instructed us to pray, Thy kingdom come, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We also looked at the penman of this book, known as John the Beloved. John, of course, was the last living apostle. He was exiled to the island of Patmos during the reign of Domitian in A.D. 95. That's when this book was penned. God had sent to him while he's on this isle of Patmos an angel, notice we read in verse 1, uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. God wants you and me to know what's a coming. And there's some stuff a-coming, amen? And we're going to learn about that as we go through this book. And then we saw, thirdly, the promise of this book. Revelation, that this book, is not given to us to confuse us. It's not given to us to puzzle us. It's not given to us to muddy the waters. Really, this book was given to us by God to clear up confusion. And God even promises to the one that reads the book a blessing. Imagine we get a blessing if we read, look at verse 3, and hear and keep the things that are written in this book. Now what I'd like to do as a form of an introduction is I'd like for you perhaps to write down some critical things to remember when studying this book. I believe there are three critical things that you and I need to remember when we're looking at the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing, number one, is this. And by the way, this is not part of the outline, amen? The book of Revelation 
deals mostly with events that have little bearing, and you'll see what I mean by that, on believers' lives. Here's what I mean by that. I'll say it again. The book of the Revelation deals mostly with events that have little bearing on believers' lives in this manner. Most of the events that we find, most of them, in the book of the Revelation take place after the church has been raptured from the earth. Now you all be happy about that. I am. Unless you want to go through the tribulation, that's fine. But we don't. If you want a somewhat of a, an outline of the book, you would have it this way. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with church age events. Chapter 4 is a picture in verse 1 and 2 of the rapture of the church, and the rest of the chapter deals with the rewards and the casting of our crowns before the throne of Jesus Christ. Chapter 5 through 19 deal with the tribulation events to the return of Jesus Christ. So when we get to chapter 5, understand we're dealing with the events of the seven-year tribulation, 5 through 19, when we find in chapter 19 the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 20, we find the millennial reign and the great white throne judgment. In chapters 21 and 22, we read of the destruction of the earth and the new heavens and the new earth. So there's a real nice outline for you to remember. Chapters 1 through 3, church age events. Chapter 4, the rapture of the church and the casting of crowns. 5 through 19, the great tribulation and the return of Jesus Christ. Chapter 20, the thousand year millennial reign. 21 and 22, the destruction of the earth and the new heavens and the new earth. So again, first thing is that the book of Re the Revelation deals mostly with events that have little bearing on our lives in that manner. Number two, <clears throat> another thing we have to remember as we look through this book, the scenes described in the book of the Revelation alternate between heaven and earth. That's an important thing to remember. Because as you're reading this, you're going to see, you're going to feel like, well, where is this taking place? Is this earth or is this heaven? We'll see sometimes it's heaven, sometimes it's on earth. For example, chapter 1, what I've read tonight and last week, is on earth. Uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 is on earth as well, the letters to the churches. Chapters 4 and 5 is in heaven. Chapter 6 is on earth. Chapter 7 and half of chapter 8 is back in heaven. Uh, the second half of chapter 8 is on the earth as the trumpet judgments take place. Chapter 10 is in heaven dealing with the little book. Chapter 11, the first portion of it, is on earth with the two witnesses. The second half is back in heaven with a worship scene. Chapters 12 and 13, we're back on earth. Israel is being persecuted. Chapters 14 and 15, we're back in heaven with the 144,000 in glory. Chapters 16 through 18, back on earth, the seven vile judgments and the two Babylons. Chapter 19, the first half of it's in heaven, the second half of it's on earth, and then chapters 20 through 22 is back in heaven. And so it's important to understand that. Sometimes we'll be reading things that'll be in heaven. Sometimes it'll be on earth. Some of these events, understand, are happening concurrently at the same time. And so he describes what's happening on earth and then jumps up to heaven and we see what's happening in heaven at the same time. Some of them are what we call parenthetical. And I'll explain that when we get to it. But that's the second thing you have to understand and I have to understand that the scenes are sometimes heaven and sometimes they're earth. There's a third thing and that is this. This book uses many symbols. Many symbols. Revelation is a book of signs and symbols. For example, candlesticks are used to symbolize churches. Stars are used to symbolize messengers. Incense odors are used to describe or depict the prayers of the saints. Now, about half of the symbols we're going to find in this book are explained in the book itself. 
In other words, it says something and then it tells us what it is. When they are not explained, we'll have to go to other parts of the Bible and search them out for clues. Now, some people have asked this, why so many symbols? Why couldn't it just be said in plain words? I like the way John Phillips put it. He said this, a sign or a symbol can be far more accurate than any type of language. Words tend to change in meaning, but symbols are fixed. In a book that deals with events in the distant future, from the time written, it was necessary to use numerous symbols. That was John Phillips. I like that. That's a good point. But understand, when we're looking at these symbols, we need to be very careful of fanciful interpretations. Oh, I've heard some weird things people said about the symbols in the book of the Revelation. We need to be careful. There are some things we're going to walk away from saying, I just don't know exactly what that is. And that's the answer. But God does. Now tonight what I'd like to do as we deal with these four, five verses, verses four through eight, what many have called the salutation. First three verses were called the introduction. These verses are called the salutation or the greeting of the letter. As John is putting forth some truths, I'd like for us to notice something he says in verse 7. Notice we read, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Notice this phrase, Even so, Amen. amen. That's a good word, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Tonight I want to preach on a, the subject, even so, amen. You know, John amens himself here. I'm always tempted to do that. Amen, preacher, good job. You say you do that sometimes. I do. But this is what John does. He does it two times in this passage. Look at the end of verse 6. He says, amen. The end of verse 7, even so, amen. You know, the word amen, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not going to depart from the passage. I'm coming back. But I'd like to, amen. <laughs> but the word amen is found 72 times in the Bible. It is found nine times in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know that Jesus Christ himself is called the amen. Interesting, isn't it? The amen. He, Jesus Christ himself, even says amen. That's a good thing. Hey, you want to be like the Lord tonight? Say amen. amen. Nothing wrong with that. Now understand what the word amen is. It is an interjection. It is a word used to convey emotion. It is the emotion of excitement. It is the emotion of agreement. It is the emotion of anticipation. I mean, looking forward to something. That's what it conveys. The word itself means this, truly. It means surely. It means uh, so be it. What it does is it, it expresses agreement with something that is said. That's why it's good to say amen. You know why? Because sometimes when the preacher's up here preaching and he's preaching about something that's a pretty rough subject and perhaps somebody's visiting in the auditorium and everyone's just sitting there staring at the preacher. They're, they sit and go, wow, I guess, you know, nobody seems to be agreeing with this. That preacher must be off his rocker. But I tell you, when people say amen, it's saying I agree. It's saying so be it. It's saying preach it, preacher, amen. amen. That's what it's saying. You know what? We have some wonderful things to amen about. We have, if you're here tonight, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have reason to amen. You have reason to say, Amen, surely, so be it. Now, let's go back to the... I told you I was getting back to this. Let's get back to the text, and consider as this introduction takes place, and I'm going down a little journey, a little bit tonight, of several things that you and I today, sitting here in 2015, on the cusp of the rapture, have reason to amen. 
Notice, first of all, number one, the recipients of the letter. The recipients of the letter. Notice how he begins in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Think for a moment. Notice that this letter is addressed primarily, primarily addressed to notice the seven churches which are in Asia. Now tonight I hope, if you've been around Capital Baptist Church for any amount of time, I hope you understand, and if you know the Bible, I hope you understand what a church is. Not everything that calls itself a church is a church. A church is an organized assembly, an organized local assembly of baptized believers that have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission and to observe the ordinances. That is a succinct definition of a church. They are a true church is a church that conforms to New Testament doctrine. We call it the Baptist distinctives. What do you think of that? I believe it's true. Historically. Now again, not everything that calls itself a church is a church. But notice the churches he's talking about. Notice the seven churches. Glance over to verse 11. They're listed. Ephesus. Smyrna. Pergamos. Thyatira. Sardis. Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. Notice they are all located in Asia Minor. If you look on a map, you'll find they're all in that particular area. But what is interesting is this. Now, follow with me. What's interesting is that there were more churches, more New Testament churches in Asia Minor than these seven. There were more than the ones he wrote to that were true churches that were doing the right thing that we would call hell to the New Testament distinctives. For example, Colossae was in that same area. Hmm. Matter of fact, wasn't far from that one church he listed, the last one, Laodicea. Look at a map. Miletus was in Asia as well. There was an assembly in Miletus. That was perhaps one of the closest assemblies to where John was on the island of Patmos. But he didn't mention that one. Troas was another assembly. That wasn't far from another church listed here named Pergamos. So why was only seven churches listed? Later on, and I just looked at it, uh, but we'll see, John's going to see in verse 12, notice if you will verse 12, and we'll deal with this in detail later, he's going to see seven golden candlesticks. If you jump down to verse 20, we find that those seven candlesticks are the seven churches. In verse 16, he sees seven stars in Christ's right hand, which are, go down to verse 20 again, just glance at it, we'll deal with this later, which are the angels or the messengers, what many believe, many believe to be the pastors of those seven churches. So I ask myself this, are those the only seven churches that Christ was concerned with? Are those the only seven pastors that Christ is concerned with? You know the answer to that. No. Why the seven? You know, the number seven is a very important number in Bible numerology. A very important. Seven in the Bible refers to the number of completion or the number of perfection or the number of fullness, or something that is finished. Now, lest you think I'm going off the deep end, let me give you some example. How many days in creation? Seven. Six in a day of rest. How many pairs of clean animals did God... The, the, the answer is going to be the same for them all, so you'll get them all right, okay? Just so you, in case you're afraid to say something, you know where I'm going. And the number of clean animals that God told Noah to bring on the ark? Seven. 
How many years in Pharaoh's dream? Seven. And then there was another seven. How many, how many uh, uh, stems in the tabernacle lampstand? Seven. Interesting. What day for Israel was set apart for the worship of God? The seventh day. How many trips did Israel make around Jericho when they were attacking it? Seven. And on the seventh day, they made seven trips. <laughs> Do you get where I'm going now? Seven. How many years in the tribulation? Seven. The 70th week of Daniel. 70th. There it is. I believe, this one's opinion, but I believe it. I believe that this earth's life is 7,000 years. I believe it's going to be all over. And we get to heaven, I believe, opinion totally, take it, throw it out, do what you want with it. We're going to find out it was God's perfect number of 7,000. Anyway, so, back to this. Yes, this epistle was written to seven literal churches that literally existed. But I believe that these churches are representative of true churches throughout the church age. Now when I say the church age, I'm talking about from the time Christ began the church until the rapture. Now these churches, we'll see, will be dealt with in detail at length in chapters 2 and 3. Now, I'm going somewhere. Please stay with me. There's something that's very important to remember. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. Is it warm in here? Or am I getting excited? Maybe a little bit of both. Notice what we read, 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now notice, three groups. Stay with me. This is foundational. It'll keep you straight in your doctrine if you get this right. There are three groups listed there. The Jew... The Gentile, which is the Gentile nations, and the church. It is vitally important to remember, as you interpret prophecy, that God has three distinct programs going on that are concurrent, happening at the same time. There is a program for the nation of Israel. There is a program for the church. And there is a program for the Gentile nations. All three of those are happening, again, at the same time. And so Israel and the church and the Gentile nations are three distinct groups. The church is not spiritual Israel. What's the big deal? Do you know why our Baptist forefathers got persecuted and beaten so much? Because those that did that, most of them, felt that the church and Israel were the same. And they were under a theocracy that had the, not only the right, but has been commanded by God to beat and persecute and uh, do whatever they had to do to keep people doctrinally straight. They had the idea that Israel and the church were the same. They're not the same. There's a program, I'll say it again, for Israel going on. There's a program for the local New Testament church that's going on. And there's a program for the Gentile nations that are going on as well. Now I want us to, and I'm going somewhere with this, uh, think about this. What a privilege that you and I have as Gentiles. By the way, if you're not a Jew in here tonight, you're a Gentile. Think about this, what a privilege that we have as a non-Jew to be a part of God's program, to be a part of what God is doing, to be a part of the local New Testament church. Now go over to Romans chapter 11. I told you I had a lot to say tonight. Romans chapter 11.
We need to be careful. Because we have been grafted in to this program. We are not something special, if you know what I mean. We are special in God's eyes. I know that. But I'm saying we weren't wonderful people, and so God said, you know what, let's just go ahead and do this over here. Forget Israel. We'll have this thing called... Because they're really nice people. They're a lot nicer than these Israelites. He didn't say that. It's a privilege. To show you how much of a privilege it is, look at verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, in so much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11:13, 13, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Notice verse 15. For if the casting away of them, the Jew, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now look at verse 17. Look at it closely. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, that's us, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. That's talking about Israel. And thou standest by faith. Notice, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. See, it's a privilege. You see, in this age, in this time frame we're in, the dispensation of the church, understand, we, the local New Testament church, we are the stewards of the mysteries of God. We are, uh, we are the organism that God desires to work through. We will be delivered before the tribulation. We have escaped the wrath to come. We can be a part of what God is doing in this world. Uh, imagine, I mean, we hear the Bible every week. What a privilege we have. Amen. See, I got you to say amen. That was my point. See, we can say amen. Because you know who he's talking about? Us. And the privileged position that we have on this earth. The recipients of the letter. Notice secondly and quickly. Not only the recipients of the letter, notice the reminder of blessings. Back to Revelation. Notice what he says. After he says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, notice he says, wrath and tribulation be unto you. Wake up, folks. Okay. That was the news. Somebody went, hmm, 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 hmm. No, grace be unto you. And peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There it is. Amen. Think about this. This book deals primarily with judgment, again, chapters 4 to chapter 19. The judgment of God upon an unbelieving world. So much so that when he returns, he's going to put all his enemies down. But, notice what the message is to the churches. The message is grace and peace. I like that. You know, often we are inclined, I know I am, to pass over those phrases in the Bible, because we read them in almost every book of the Bible. Grace and peace unto you, and mercy be, well, mercy be multiplied, all that. Okay, okay, let's get to the book now. No, 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 no. Let's back up. Let's, let's park there for a moment. Look at the blessings that God gives us. Grace. Grace. 
Now, now there's two types of grace in the Bible. Uh, there is saving grace. That is uh, that unmerited favor. That's the Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. That is God giving us something that we do not deserve. And that something is salvation. Amen? We don't deserve salvation. We deserve the pits of hell because of our sin. But God gives us grace. But you know, there's more grace than just saving grace. And I mentioned this, I think, in another message not long ago. And that's living grace. That's what we find here. He's writing to the churches. He's talking about uh, living grace. You know what that's defined as? Listen to this. I looked it up in uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. And it says, It is the divine influence on the heart as reflected in the life. I like that. The divine influence upon the heart as reflected in the life. In other words, as God and His Word influences our heart, He enables us to live the Christian life. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what is happening in the world around us. Now understand in both cases, a saving grace and living grace are appropriated by faith. But he gives us grace. And then he gives us peace. He gives us peace. So many people, oh, the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a minute. You saved? Amen. Then peace unto you. Peace unto you. Regardless of what's happening, He's telling these churches, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what I'm about to tell you in a little bit, you can have the peace of God that passes all understanding. It is a peace that the world does not know. It is a peace that the world does not experience. It is a peace that the world can never understand until they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So he gives us blessings, grace and peace. But notice some things about this grace and peace as we move on. Notice, first of all, who it's from. He says, grace and peace be unto you, and I'm sorry, grace be unto you and peace from him. Notice, which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Notice, we, we find all three persons of the Godhead here. We see grace and peace given from God the Father. Notice, from Him which is, which was, which is to come. He transcends all time. We see from God the Spirit. Notice, from the seven spirits which are before His throne. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. You say, preacher, are you sure about that? Yes, I am. Go to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3. Don't go there now, but write it down. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of fear of the Lord. Uh, add them up. I think I had up wrong, but it's seven of them. The seven spirits. But then from the Son, God the Son, from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness. Notice who we get this peace and grace from. But then notice also how it was secured. Look at verse 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How do we get this grace and peace? It begins with knowing Jesus Christ and the work that was accomplished on the cross of Calvary. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He not only saved us from the penalty of our sin, He saved us from the power of sin in our lives and will remove us later from the very presence of sin. His work on the cross of Calvary enables us uh, to live the Christian life. If you're here tonight saying, I just can't live this Christian life, if you're saved, you can. You absolutely can. It was secured, grace and peace, on the cross of Calvary. But notice what he makes us. Not only who it's from. Not only how it was secured. Notice what he makes us. I like this in verse 6. And hath made us 
kings and priests. Amen. Kings and priests. Kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look at this position He gives us. I mean, think about that. What grace and peace there is. I mean, it's enough that He saved us. Amen. Not only does He save us, He gives us a position, notice, as kings and priests. You know, one day, according to Revelation 20, we'll see this later, you and I are going to rule and reign with him. I like that. I'm part of the royal family. I got an inheritance. I'm a joint heir. I got an inheritance? I don't feel like I have an inheritance. Not on this earth. I'm going to be a king and we're priests. What blessings we have being part of the local New Testament church in this age. We are priests. I don't know how to do the collar, but anyway. What does that mean? It means we have access to the throne of God. We have access to the throne of God. We can pray to the God of heaven through his blood, and he answers our prayer. We are go-betweens, if you will. We stand between the living and the dead. Amen to that. See, I can say amen tonight, just like John did, because of this was addressed to a church, and I'm a part of the local New Testament church. And because I am, I've got some blessings. Blessings beyond anything I deserve. Uh, I mean, think about it. Grace and, and peace from the Godhead and kings and priests. That's where we are. Don't ever forget the blessings we have. But then there's a third little amen that we see. Not only the recipients of the letter, not only the reminder of blessings. Notice thirdly, there's another amen, and that's to the return of Christ. We were singing tonight something, I forget which one it was, but uh, it had a, a, um, a verse, it may have been this morning, no, I think it was tonight, we were talking about, Christ is coming over the world victorious. About 10 of you out there said, amen. I mean, you just stopped singing, just threw an amen in there. I like that. That's okay. Now, not everybody do that because we'd miss the words, you know, for a little bit. But, you know, why not? Amen. Now watch this. Why do we say amen that Christ is coming? A lot of reasons. One, because he is. Two, because it's something I can look forward to. Why is that? I'm going to show you here in a minute. You know, the second coming of Jesus Christ is two stages. Two stages. The first stage is the rapture. The rapture. Where Jesus Christ comes, not to earth, but to meet us in the air. It's done in the twinkling of an eye. I mean, in a moment. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 quickly. Because I want to I read about it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that, notice, we, notice the pronoun, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. By the way, that's the doctrine of imminence. Paul writes, we which are alive, he thought he was coming during his lifetime. We which are alive, let's read on. 
Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, but that phrase caught up, and that's what the word rapture means. It's a catching away. We'll be caught up. It is a sudden catching away of believers. It is imminent. It can happen at any time. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such a time as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Amen. He's coming. It is pictured in Revelation chapter 4. It removes the church from the world. Again, before the tribulation, it is a pre-tribulational rapture. That's what the Bible teaches. But there's a second stage of the second coming, and that is the revelation. The rapture, he comes for his saints. The revelation, he returns to earth with his saints. Revelation chapter 19, Jesus Christ returns. This is when every eye shall see him. He comes back and he judges the nations of this world. There'll be the judgment of the nations. When he returns, he'll set up his kingdom upon this earth. And in between those two events uh, of the rapture and the revelation is the seven-year tribulation. Matthew 24 says it this way. In verse 29, Jesus Christ, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now here's my point. Go back to Revelation chapter 1. Because there's a great contrast here in the Bible that you have to make note of. The Bible says that believers rejoice in that day when Jesus Christ comes again. Amen? We, we rejoice. T uh, Titus 2.13. We look for that blessed hope. That's what it's called. It is the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. We're looking for We want it to come. That's what we're looking for. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. It's called our blessed hope. It is a, a time we rejoice in, we look forward to. Why? Because we will not experience the wrath of God. We will not experience the tribulation. We will not go through God's unparalleled judgment upon this earth. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us under wrath. He does not. But notice what he says in verse 7. Because there's a contrast here. While we rejoice in that day, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall what? Wail. The wail because of him. Even so, Amen. It's a pretty heavy word. Wail. Wailing is more than just a cry. It's agonizing. It's a deep, deep, deep grief. Why are they going to wail? Why? Because the one that they've denied, the one that they've scorned, the one that they've mocked and have refused his love 
and have spurned off his offer of salvation, now there's no escape. There's no hiding. They must face him face to face and judgment is inescapable. We ought not to rejoice in that. I think it's Proverbs talks about not rejoicing in another man's calamity. But I'll tell you what I will say, knowing that I know the Lord, and knowing if you know that you know the Lord, I want to say what John said, even so. Amen. I'm sure glad I'm saved. I'm sure glad I'm living when I'm living. I'm sure glad of the privilege of being part of a local New Testament church. I'm sure glad God has conferred upon us grace and peace, not tribulation, the tribulation. I'm sure glad that when he comes again, I know because of what the Bible teaches that I will not have to face him for my sins because all of my sins have been judged on the cross of Calvary. Even so come. Lord Jesus. We have reason to say amen. We say amen if you're involved in God's program. Say amen tonight if you've been given blessings from God. Say amen tonight because we have escaped the wrath to come. Oh, we're going to see so many things in this book. It's going to be sad, but you know what? I'm so glad I know the Lord and we ought to rejoice and what he's done for us. Let's pray together.